This morning, uh, we are going to take a break from the Book of Romans, of course, and uh, we are going to address the subject of Mother's Day, mothers. And this morning, I want to tell you a story from the Bible about a mother. We are in 1 Samuel chapter number 1, and uh, we are going to talk about Hannah, the mother of Samuel. I will be doing this in story format as we go through the first chapter of the book of Samuel. The first word is now. It says, now there was a certain man. The first word, now, dates it during or close to the end of the period of the judges. It was a very low time in the, in the life of the nation Israel. Spiritually, things had just gone downhill. Uh, idolatry, uh, worship of false gods, all kinds of uh, things. People had just abandoned the temple. Spiritual the nation was at an extremely low ebb. Secondly, uh, they were at a low ebb physically. Uh, economically, uh, education, politically, their relationship with other nations. Um, the description that God gives twice in the book of Judges about the times in which this incident took place says in Judges 17, 6, In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. I see a little of that beginning to happen in our country, amen? You know, it seems like everybody, whatever they do, because they're doing it, that makes it all right. Now, when it says there was no king in Israel, it doesn't mean there wasn't physically one on the throne. What there was, was inept leadership. Uh, there, there, was, uh, there was a king who wasn't doing his job. In the modern translation, that would be, we have political leaders who weren't doing their job. Now, I know young people probably don't think like this, but those who are, you know, who, who remember America years ago, and I remember the country that I came to, uh, I mean, we've got leaders that do whatever anybody wants or they think they need, just print some money and give it to them. That sounds good, and it does for the short term help people. But it destroys the long range. Government cannot be all things to all men. That's for work. And you know, I love my country, and I really love the state of Texas, but my goodness, what are those boys in Austin thinking? Now, anybody can buy a gun, no question asked, but ever. I mean, are we going to go back to the wild, wild west? It meant inept leadership. And never man did that which was right in his own eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, we are losing. The news media won't touch it, but this is not the news media. This is God's pulpit. But we're losing policemen in our nation at a terribly alarming rate. Because in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So here are the circumstances that this story takes place. And there are two things that take place that I want to encourage you with. Number one, there were still, even though these were terrible times for the nation physically and spiritually, 
there were still godly people. Amen. Folks, America still has godly people. Christians who live like Christians, who believe like Christians, who do like Christians, there still is salt and light in this dark world. And the second thing I want you to see that is encouraging is at the right time, at God's right time, God still has a man. And out of this story will come a baby who will grow up to be a man who will turn the nation back to God. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim. I got that right the first time. Of Mount Ephraim. And his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroboam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tu, the son of Ziph, and Ephrathite. Jewish people kept strict records of their lineage. And he had two wives. Uh, let me pause there and make an explanation. For a man to have one wife, more than one wife at the same time, uh, is not God's plan. First of all, I don't know if anybody can afford more than one at the same time. I mean, plain old purity economy would keep a man from doing that, I, I would think. But he had two wives. Why? Why would a God-fearing Christian like he was a worship of God? Why do you have two wives? Well, social acceptability overrode his biblical conviction. <coughs> Our churches are heat up with that today, folks. Amen. Well, in, Judaism, in the life of Judaism, for a woman, a young woman, not to be married was a real shame, disgrace, and dishonor. And then for a young woman to or be a childbearing age, marry and not have children was a reproach on that family and society beyond what I am able to describe to a Gentile audience. So when it became obvious that Hannah was not going to bear children, her husband married another woman. And with that woman, with that second wife, he was having children and it took the reproach off the family. Now the question is, did it work? Well, the shorter answer is absolutely not. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah. Now Hannah was the love of his life. That's the one he married because he loved her. And the name of the other was Penina. Penina he married because it was socially needful to have children. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now that set the home up for conflict. My mama used to say, one woman to one kitchen. I don't know, anybody else still feels that way? I think a lot of folks today feel like, you want the kitchen, you got it, I'm out of there. And this man went up out of his city, yearly to worship the um, and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Three times a year, the males in Judea were to go to the temple at Shiloh and sacrifice and worship. One of those times was the Feast of Harvest. That's why the family went along this time. Because when they offered their fruits and their crops and the, their, their animals and, and all that stuff that had to be offered, after it was offered, a part of it was to make a meal for the whole family. 
The nearest thing that we would have that in our church life would be every once in a while when we get down here, we go back to the fellowship hall and have a meal. This is as close to that as it comes other than it was a part of their worship. And the two sons of Eli, the high priest, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah had offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons, all her, all her sons and daughters, portions, in other words, food for the meal. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion. He gave a lot more because he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary, that would be the other wife, Penina, also provoked her sore, tormented her. But look, I've got all these kids and you don't have any. For to make her fret, Hannah, because the Lord had shut up her womb, which was in Israel considered a great issue. And as he did so, year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, her Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk, after the meal, in other words. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by the post of the temple door. And she was in bitterness of soul, Hannah was. And she prayed unto the Lord and wept. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. In other words, she said, Lord, if you'll give me a child, I'll dedicate him to you. And there shall the razor come upon his head. It's called the Nazarite vow. <clears throat> when a child is dedicated to the Lord, a Nazarite would spend his life serving the Lord. They would have long hair, and they would drink no alcoholic beverage. Now, unlike the long-haired people today, when a man had long hair, which by the way, the Bible says it is a shame for a man to have long hair. That's what it says. But a Nazarite would not cut his hair only for the period that they are fasting and praying. And then they would cut their hair. There is no premise in the Bible for a man to let his hair grow long like a woman and keep it that way. There is no premise in the Bible for that. As a matter of fact, long hair on a man in the Bible spoke of rebellion against his manhood and God. Now that's the truth in the Bible about long hair. And it came to pass as you continued praying before the Lord that Eli... Mark them out. Now the chief is sitting over there on the side and she's at the altar praying and, and he's watching her and he doesn't hear anything but her lips are moving so he makes the wrong assumption. Now Hannah, she's faking her heart on your lips move, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. Eli, one of her spiritual priests, was he? Even a man with a little spiritual sense should have understood what was going on there. And Eli said unto her, How long will you be drunk and put away wine from thee? By the way, they drank wine at all those feasts, all of the Old Testament feasts, uh, even the Passover. It began and ended with wine. And so Eli 
not being a very spiritual man because he raised two really bad boys. Um, he just thought she had drunk too much wine she was drunk. So Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've poured out my soul before the Lord. When men are disturbed on the inside, they usually have a fit. Sometimes they even use words they shouldn't use, and then they're over it. But ladies are not made like that. When ladies have a problem, they grieve very deeply, sometimes for a very long time. And what Penain of the other wife had been putting Hannah through is just grieving her to no end. Verse 16, Come not mine hand for daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my claim, complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. See, Isaiah 57, 5 says, A broken spirit, O God, thou wilt not despise. So now then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine hand make find grace in thy sight. So the woman went away and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. She left it with the Lord, and she went in peace. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned, and came to the house to Ramah. And now Cana knew Hannah's wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about. After Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, meaning given to me of the Lord, saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and, and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until I have weaned him, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. She was committed to keep the promise she made when she was in bitterness of soul and prayed. She was going to keep her word. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good. Um, do what seemeth thee good. Tarry until thou have weaned him, which is about three months normally, only the Lord establish his word. Would to God that our families would all operate on um, thus saith the Lord. The Lord established his word. So the woman abode and gave her some suck until he was weaned, and when she had weaned him, she took him up with her and three and three bullocks and one heap of flour and a bottle of wine. That's what they were supposed to do when they dedicated the child. And brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. A baby. Born, asked of God. Those years when Hannah could not have a child, those years when Penina was tormenting her, those years, quite frankly, when Elkanah was, uh, was uh, yielding to social pressure and was not willing to wait on God's timing, she didn't know what was going to happen. She didn't know what God was going to do. But God had a plan for Hannah. God had a plan for the priesthood. God had a plan for the nation. And folks, even when things don't look good, God always has a plan. Our job is to be still and know that He is God. Our job is to fear not, but be still and see the salvation of the Lord. Hannah had a dilemma. She had a broken heart. She was misunderstood. She was hated by the other wife. She was childless.
Folks, sometimes that's a part of the Christian life. Yea, they that will live godly shall suffer persecution. Yea, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. But Hannah had a plan based on the word of the Lord. She was going to take the problem to the Lord. She was going to pray. The Bible says in James 5, 16, the effect of a fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. She had a plan. And she prayed. Because only God could help her in this situation. She was in a situation where the help of man is vain. Have we not at one time or another in our life been there? When the only thing we can do is to pour out our hearts unto the Lord. Psalm 68. Pour out your heart unto the Lord and, and leave it there. And in that situation, she made a vow to the Lord. Now, she only did what the Bible already said she was supposed to do. This was not a rash vow. This was not a promise made out of desperation. This, was, this had nothing to do with fear. This was not a vow made that she had no intention of keeping. No. This was a vow based on the Word of God because under Old Testament Jewish rules for their families, the first male born was to be dedicated to God. So she was only doing what the Bible said to do. Every first male was to be dedicated to the Lord. There is a principle of first things in the Bible. The first day belongs to God. Every male was dedicated to the Lord. The first fruit of the harvest were dedicated to the Lord. The first tenth of the income was the tithe. The first day of the week was for worship. There, God is one mono, and that principle of one really follows all through the Bible and should follow all of us through life. Because God always has a plan. So she made a vow based on God's plan. But seek ye first, Matthew 6, 33, the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Or if, if we would just grow in faith, to believe what God says and to act on that belief, how much better all of our lives would be. And then I want you to notice Hannah's confidence in God. She went to the altar. She prayed. She poured her heart out to God. She made her vow. And when she left, it says she was no more sad. How many of us, when we pray to commit things to God, then we get up off our knees, we go on and take our problem with us? Leave it there. Leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, to him that knocketh. It shall be opened. She went away. No more said. And as God had promised, in the right time, in God's time, Hannah had a baby boy. And she followed through with the vow. And she dedicated him to the Lord. And she brought him to Eli. And, and he was raised under the auspices of of Eli and uh, and uh, the mother came once a year to visit the boy and uh, watched him grow and Eli, Eli uh, uh, Samuel developed physically and spiritually and he was God's man who was God's voice to the nation in a very difficult time 
And God used this one man, born as of, out of due time, and God used him to bring a measure of revival for a time to the nation. And as a consequence of that, and this is not my sermon, it would be another sermon, Hannah sang a song of praise unto the Lord in chapter 2. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in <coughs> thy salvation. And then that's developed in the next ten verses. Motherhood is very special to God. Motherhood is of God. Our children are a sacred trust from God. How we need in our beloved nation mothers who will commit their children to the Lord. And by the way, I'm talking of mothers and fathers and grandparents if you're raising children how we need to commit them to the Lord how we need to pray for them and pray with them and read the Bible to them and bring them to Sunday school and church how America needs a turning to the Lord how our families need to be raised in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And those of us who are past that point in our lives, how we need to pray for the Lord to do that again in our, in our nation and in our families and in our homes. Because as goes the family, so goes the nation. Amen. May God and his blessing to this simple story, basically, that I have told to you from the Bible. There are so many other things here that I haven't even touched on. I simply wanted to tell you the story this morning of a godly mother and what a, what, what a difference it made in that nation at that time. And who knows what mother today raising a child that God will yet use to bring revival to America. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me, please? With every head bowed and every eye closed. Today's a special day. If you still have living mothers, Call them, spend some time with them, do something. If your mothers are gone, like most of us are, honor their memories. Respect them. Love them. This is all God's plan for society. This is all so that we can live amongst each other peacefully. So sorely May the Lord bless you as you live your lives. May the Lord bless you as you're committed to Him. May the Lord bless you as you share your faith in a society that is pretty much against what I have preached about. But yet, to let our light shine for Jesus Christ. Precious Father, thank you for your word that teaches us. Thank you for your word that instructs us. I thank you for Christian families. I thank you for believers. We pray for those amongst us who are still raising children. Give them strength. Give them grace. Give them courage. We claim the promises of the word of God that you're real and you're with us and you will help us. Bless this day, I pray.
and we'll praise you and love you and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We're going to sing a song. Number 247. Number 247.